Mark, you meet him and, you, and you're immediately impressed. And after all, he's running an organization that's the largest anti-genocide organization in, in the world. And, um, but in interviewing him, I learned that he actually struggled a little bit in the early years of uh, balancing his heart and his head. And so with your permission, I'd like to read <laughs> your, short, your short passage uh, and then talk for a few minutes. <clears throat> Mark Hanna says he owes his life to genocide. After all, if it hadn't been for the Holocaust, his grandparents never would have met. All four of Mark's grandparents fled continental Europe at the start of World War II. Mark wanted his college classmates to be as fervent about stopping genocide as he was. Mark started skipping more classes and spending his afternoons in the library, pitching his idea for a citizen-funded anti-genocide initiative to anyone he thought might listen. He even tried to contact Colin Powell, then, Secretary, then U.S. Secretary of State, sending messages to various combinations of Mr. Powell's name in the hopes of guessing at the correct email address. It didn't work. It didn't work it. By the end of the semester, Mark was nearly failing three classes. He had hardly seen his friends. He rarely slept in his own bed. Instead, he fell asleep in a chair in the Civic and Social Justice Center, where he'd been trying to generate more online donations. His body may have been tired, but his heart was on full blast. During exam week, he stayed awake for nearly three days in a row, alternating between studying, maintaining his website, trying to raise money to fund peacekeepers, and volunteering. On his way back to tutoring one day at the local elementary school, he collapsed in the middle of the road. The next thing he knew, the school building was receding in the back window of an ambulance, and his head felt as if it were being squeezed between the jaws of an enormous vice. A paramedic laid his hand on Mark's shoulder. Hang in there, buddy, he said. You can make it. <laughs> and he did. Uh, and uh, the way we described it when writing the book was sort of you were running on heart fumes. Um, can you tell me what you were thinking about those days after recovery? You had a seizure. You had kind of worked too hard. You were exhausted. And how, the, how what happened affected the way in which you... And, the way in which you developed your role within your organization. Yeah. yeah. Um, <laughs> so it's kind of funny, and this was what didn't make it into the book that Dan Weiss loves to uh, chat about. So the real story about why I was staying up so late doing community service was it was mandated by a court. Because I had a, we talked about balancing heart and uh, head, I had a hard time also balancing my bladder. And on Halloween nights, I went across the street and went on someone's tree. Um, so the police caught me, and uh, that's why I was doing community service. Um, so also learned how to balance other organs of my body at the same time. Um, anyway, so uh, as uh, Laura said, uh, I was I was overextended on the passion side and not really thinking strategically, um, and so the big the big aha moment for me, uh, maybe the moment of obligation is you've got to preserve yourself in order to actually be effective in the long run. So the big thing that a lot of people always a lot of us always say what's on your to do list. So the big thing for me was what's on my do not do list, and so I had to spend a lot of time thinking about what I will not spend time on and not put my energy in, so I can be more effective at the limited amount of time that I was awake to be able to do something. And your organization, the organization that you co-founded, uh, Genocide Intervention Network, recently merged with Save Our Four, with uh, 864,000 people or so in uh, your network. So it's, again, the largest uh, anti-genocide organization in the world. Uh, as your organization and your career grows, what is it that keeps you going through even the most challenging times? Um, so I, uh, I think the fundamental thing for me, which I imagine a lot of Equity Green Fellows have, is this idealism with realism. And that is, I know if we can abolish slavery, and we still have huge issues with human trafficking and modern slavery, the fact is we can significantly uh, prevent or get much better at stopping mass atrocities. Uh, and I'm delighted to see a lot of that progress happening right now in Libya. We're seeing a lot in the news right now with Ivory Coast. So the fact that I know that um, Albeit late, my grandparents were able to survive the Holocaust, and I'm alive, and seeing what's happening today in Libya and Ivory Coast, I know that that's possible. So it's how to balance, again, that realism with idealism that keeps me going is, uh, it's a meaningful piece of, uh, it's a meaningful pursuit, and it's just to find the most effective way to accomplish it. Last question is about advice. 
to, about building a meaningful impact-driven career? Advice. Um, <laughs> uh, um, don't drink as much after <laughs> um, Watch a lot of TV. Um, I'm going to a Glee concert in June if anyone wants to come. Um, I think the I think the big thing that I uh, when I think about advice is uh, all of us spend a lot of time at work, um, and a lot of us uh, are trying to find ways to make it more meaningful. Some of us are really blessed to have organizations like Equine Green that create that space to have our uh, almost complete overlap between your job and your passion. Um, and what I think is, we spend more time at work than we do with our friends and family. And so I think the advice I try to give to people, while I'm still extremely young and inexperienced, is to find as many ways possible to get as much overlap between what you care about and what you spend the majority of your time doing. Because um, you'll really enjoy your days and your weekends a lot more that way.